O thou who art the apple of mine eye, my glory, the ocean of my loving kindness, the sun of my bounty, the heaven of my mercy rest upon thee. We pray God to illumine the world through thy knowledge and wisdom, to ordain for thee that which will gladden thine heart and impart consolation to thine eyes. Baha'u'llah. This is my firm, my unshakable conviction, the essence of my unconcealed and explicit belief. My station is the station of servitude, a servitude which is complete, pure, and real. Abdul Baha. Thank you. So this week, we're really happy to have Mr. Masood Olufani, and he's going to be talking about the blues idiom of Abdul Baha, using the color blue as a spiritual metaphor for the character of Abdul Baha. Mr. Olufani is an Atlanta-based actor, mixed media artist, and writer whose studio practice is rooted in the discipline of sculpture. He's a graduate of Morehouse College and the Savannah College of Art and Design, where he earned an MFA in sculpture in 2013. Masood has exhibited his work in group and solo shows nationally and internationally. He's a featured artist in the 2024 Dakar Biennale in Senegal. Um, he's completed residencies at the Vermont Studio Center, the Hambridge Center for Arts and Sciences, and Creative Currents in Portobello, Panama. He's a 2020 South Arts Cross Sector grant recipient for Elder, a site specific installation created to coincide with the redevelopment of the historic David T. Howard School in Atlanta. Masood is a 2018 Southern Arts Prize State Fellow, a recipient of a 2015 and 2018 IDEA Capital Grant, a Southwest Airlines Art and Social Engagement Grant, and a recipient of the 2015 to 16 MOCA GA Working Artist Project Grant. As an actor, he had a recurring role on the BET series, The Quad, and has appeared in numerous television shows, including Greenleaf, Being Mary Jane, Devious Maids, Satisfaction, and Nashville. He's a featured actor in the film biopic, All Eyes on Me. He was the co-host of the PBS news-based investigative journalism show, Retro Report, which premiere premiered nationally in the fall 2019. He's the co-host of the podcast series, Undaunted, which centers the work of social justice changemakers. He's the lead actor in No Cowards in Our Band, about the life of Frederick Douglass, set to premiere at Hudson Valley Opera in Hudson Valley, New York, in the fall of 2024. So with that, I'm happy to hand it off to Mr. Olufani. Good morning, good morning. Well, it's good afternoon now. We're just after the 12 o'clock hour here on the east side. So what's up, what's up, what's up? Good to see everybody. Um, happy to be here. Um, really, that's, you know, I gotta, we have to, really the, the, the only important thing in that entire uh, biography is the fact that uh, I, I view myself as a creative and an artist. All that other stuff is fluff, but I understand why we, we include those things. But um, I say an artist and a creator because it has a lot to do with what I'm gonna talk about today. And um, I really view it as one of the great joys and gifts of my life that I'm able to spend my time doing something that is so important to me and not have it exist at the periphery of my being, but actually be anchored at the center of my being. And, you know, I, I think about, you know, this talk is titled The Blues Idiom of Abdul Baha. And those of us who know what an idiom uh, means, it's just a fancy way of saying uh, a mode of expression, uh, creativity in the arts, um, singing, dancing, acting, writing, what have you. And, um, and I, I was thinking about, uh, as I was thinking about this talk and thinking about the person of Abdul Baha, reflecting on his quality and character. Uh, one of the reasons why I became a Baha'i initially back in all the way back in 1992 when I was a student at Morehouse College was because of my study of the life of Abdul Baha, uh, the many ways that he seemed to embody um, all of these spiritual qualities and virtues that uh, most of human society appreciates. They ring something true within our hearts and our spirits. So I recognized that within him. In particular, it was his kind of um, engagement around the issue of race. Of course, as a person of African descent, as a young black man uh, growing up in the United States and dealing with the issue of race, uh, the systemic multi-generational trauma that runs through my family and my entire community as a result of racism, vis-a-vis -vis slavery, vis-a-vis -vis reconstruction, uh, institutionalized um, you know, uh, discrimination and racism. And so I was particularly interested in how Abdul Baha kind of uh, coalesced around this issue and used it as a, um, 
uh, he demonstrated in his character and his behavior that um, the issue of racism in this dispensation, in this revelation of God, um, the emphasis, the principle of principles of this faith is the oneness of mankind. So it was something that's very attractive to me. Um, for those of you who are new to the Baha'i faith, this may be your first or maybe even your second time um, hearing about the faith. Uh, it's a world religion. Um, the uh, main focus of the faith is the oneness of mankind, the elimination of all prejudice, be that based on the color of one's skin, be that based on gender, be that based on um, religious affiliation, be that based on social class, what have you. Um, the Baha'i faith's main focus and thrust is the elimination of all these isms that have afflicted the body politic and continue to keep us in a state of our adolescence when we are meant to be, uh, to be moving towards our adulthood. Um, I've been a Baha'i since 1992. Uh, I had a varied religious experience. I uh, uh, grew up uh, part of my life in the Christian church, also was a member of the Nation of Islam. My father was, uh, had a, was a great admirer of the work of Malcolm X, otherwise known as Malik al Haj Shabazz. So as a small child living in Miami, uh, we used to go to the mosque for three or four hours uh, a week. Uh, the only way my father could get me to go was to uh, promise to get me a bean pie. I don't know if you've ever had Muslim bean pies uh, in the Nation of Islam, but they are good. So uh, I had a, a kind of varied religious experience. I was in the um, Quaker movement for a while, which coming from having experience in kind of like the Southern Baptist, the effusive kind of expression of the Southern Baptist tradition of the black church, when you go to a Quaker service, it's quite different because everybody's silent until they feel moved and then they stand up and speak. So I had to get used to that, but I, was a, I admired the Quakers' commitment to the anti-slavery movement and the uh, lineage of that. So uh, I was attracted to that. Um, I, when I went to college, I uh, experienced a deep spiritual crisis, which I don't have to get into right now, but it led me to investigate a lot of different things. And that investigation ultimately led me to the Baha'i faith vis-a-vis -vis through um, a girlfriend that I had at the time, an incredible actress at Spelman College, who was not a Baha'i, who introduced me to a woman on Spelman's campus who was a Baha'i. And from there, I learned about the faith, was very attractive, and eventually became a Baha'i. So that's the cliff noted version of my journey and a little bit of an explanation about the faith. Uh, the prophet of the faith is Baha'u'llah. That name means the glory of God. Um, and there are other principles we can get into, the equality of women and men, the um, uh, the universal education for everybody on the planet, the oneness of the world's religion, and they go on and on. But the synchronon, the principle of principles, the apogee of Baha'i principles is uh, the elimination of all prejudice, the oneness of humanity. So that being said, I prepared a bit of a, um, a PowerPoint that I thought might be helpful. And I talked a little bit about what an idiom is. Um, I want to just talk really briefly about this whole idea of the color blue. And uh, so I'm going to we're going to go through a little bit of that. We're going to talk about how the color blue operates, not just in the um, in the contingent world, in the, in the in the physical world, but how it also has these kind of other underlying kind of um, intimations, this kind of like spiritual qualities that are associated with uh, the African diaspora of the cultures around the world and how those qualities are reflected in the character and personage of Abdu'l-Baha. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about this difference between um, uh, what, we, what we say in the hip hop community, we talk about swagger and having swag. And we talk about this kind of like cool disposition, like I'm chill, I'm cool. And how uh, sometimes that is a performative uh, uh, you know, uh, thing that we do. We, it's like a, a costume or an outfit we put on, and there's a difference between that kind of like performative notion of swag and an embodied swagger that is rooted in morality, spiritual discipline, ethics, um, and principles. So let's, uh, let's move forward. Okay, we just heard this amazing, like, um, we started off uh, this session with uh, this incredible song um, sang by these brothers and sisters about the qualities of Abdu'l-Baha. I mean, it's beautiful talking about um, how Abdu'l-Baha Abdul saw himself, how it was not important to him, how much money you have, what um, social class you're in, um, what particular part of the world you come from, what language you speak. But actually the station of servitude is the highest station that anyone can aspire to, particularly within the context of the Baha'i faith. So Baha'is are striving to 
vis-a-vis the example of Abdu'l-Bahá to live up to, to embody that station of servitude in our day-to-day lives, how we interact with uh, our fellow men and women, and how we seek for opportunities to serve one another. So anyway, I wanted to share, I also think another way of expression, because I think devotion, dedication, um, uh, devotion to God can be shown in a lot of different ways. And for me, one of those ways is through the uh, music of hip hop. And I was raised on hip hop in New York City. Uh, I remember when hip hop broke, broke on the scene. And when it started off, it was about poetry and uh, consciousness. It was about um, commenting on the social, uh, on, on kind of like the social landscape of America. And there was something regenerative about that, something even I would argue in some ways deeply spiritual. And of course, it kind of got off track in some ways, but there's always remained a committed group of artists within the hip hop community who have constantly been about creating this modality of constructive resilience through art, through music, talking about the uh, social um, the social landscape of our culture, of our times, and then also talking about ways to transcend, to overcome those circumstances. So I wanted to share a piece by my man, Kaz, Kaz from Canada. This piece is called Electric Heat, the sequel. And I think uh, what you'll see in the lyrics, he's talking about, uh, he's embodying that, that, that quality of the hip hop artist as being someone who's, uh, talking about things that are, are worth exploring and reflecting on. Okay, it's about to go down. Please step up. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. It's the return. Burn like a supernova. Spin the plate, the great debate's over. Don't rush, take it easy, slow down. The earth is a spaceship spinning round and round. We're in it together. We can make it better, don't sweat her. Things swing with no vendetta. I rhyme in a graph style, carve every letter. To move every b-boy king like Coretta. Scott, keep it hot, block must rock. The plot that we try to recognize what's not. The L to the O V M O V E K dub. Dropping a dub is new TV. The E M C double E, no doubt. Running around, wigging out, turning the party out. We all fall from grace and make mistakes erase a face to face with the antidote face and every single word in the verb wild style this is not a mission it's a riddle lifestyle i'm still in the struggle and i see the light dial turn it to 10 ascend what's in the profile can you feel it to the beat y'all let the music play for the people and if you're down to rock whether you're ready or not yo guess who's back with the sequel oh yeah i just do it just do it now in the beginning the light that shines so bright within the city of my mind skate night listening listening the moon reflecting the sun making me one with the music oh get low get bold get hold it's liquid black gold yes i'm in the house but i never ever sold prime black vinyl 20 years old with the mic in my hand ringing alarm singing the song bringing the calm to drama so hard too much info been so instrumental potential exponential my dj's cuts off presidential yo jazz let the rhythm hit him. I woke up to make the main cut to face the pain. What the space contain love? It's a heat seeker. Back in the speaker, the beat, the sleep preacher. It was written. The seat can you feel it? To the beat, y'all. Let the music play for the people. And if you're down to rock, whether you're ready or not, yo, guess who's back with the sequel? I just do it. Casting stones from afar We're like people driving in our cars On lost highway My
Yeah, just a little bit from uh, chaos. Um, really interesting because for me, uh, that's an example again of hip hop uh, in a kind of redemptive form. We're talking about, uh, and also an example of this concept of blue. Um, just a couple of quotes from the Baha'i Faith that kind of anchor us in this notion of using the arts uh, in terms of the arts capacity to serve humanity in a really deep and meaningful way. Baha'u'llah and the Kitab Yaqdas, which is another, uh, which, which means the most holy book, it's the holiest of books that we have in the Baha'i Faith says, we verily have made music as a ladder for your souls, a means whereby they may be lifted up unto the realm on high. And in the Epistle to the Son of the Wolf, another of the Baha'i books, he says, arts, crafts, and sciences uplift the world of being and are conducive to its ex exaltation. Blues idiom of Abdul Baha, in the person of Abdul Baha, the incompatible characteristics of a human nature and a superhuman knowledge and perfection have been blended and are completely harmonized. Now, this is really interesting because this statement um, really describes the intersection, the intersectionality where the spirit meets the human form and how Abdul Baha, from the context of the Baha'i faith, embodies this kind of perfect balance between those two realities and how those things have been blended, right? All of us, most of us in our in our day-to-day -day lives and our spiritual journeys, sometimes we are, uh, we behave in more noble ways. Sometimes we behave in ignoble ways and we're constantly struggling, hopefully, all of us, to become better on a day-to-day -day basis. From the Baha'i, from the high perspective, Abdu'l-Baha, who we consider to be the perfect exemplar of the Baha'i teachings, embodies perfectly this balance of the human condition and the spiritual condition. What is the blues? Of course, we have the blues as iteration as a color. It's my favorite color. When I was a young boy, people used to ask me all the time. I love blue, still love blue. In popular culture, the blues refers to a musical art form of the African-American tradition with roots in the Deep South. It incorporates elements of the field holler songs, work songs, ring shouts, and spirituals. Many elements such as call and response can be traced back to Africa. And I want to give you a little bit of an example of the call and response tradition. Um, this is from the movie 12 Years a Slave. Went down to the River Jordan where John baptized three, where I walked the devil in hell, said Johnny baptized me. I say, Roger and roll, roll, Roger and roll. My soul arise, heaven, Lord, for the year Roger and roll. Well, some say John was a Baptist, some say, some say John was a Jew. But I say John was a preacher cause my Bible says so too. I say Roger and Roe, Roger and Roe. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year is Roe. Hallelujah, Roger and Roe, Roger and Roe. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year when Jordan Roe. So one of the things that I think is really important to talk about in uh, talking about this notion of the blues, and we just saw an example of kind of like the birthplace of blues music. The blues music is often described as uh, this musical art form. It comes out of the field holler songs, the spirituals. It is generated by this uh, uh, intersectionality of you know, of the human condition and also the spiritual, the mundane and the majestic, that which is quotidian, but also that which is transcendent. And what I mean by that is there's this kind of, 
it, the blues, the field holler songs come out of the suffering and the pain of those enslaved Africans who were brought from the west coast of Africa to the United States, who were trying to find ways to articulate their condition, um, to trying to find ways to release the emotions that they have buried deep within them, the, uh, the pain, the melancholy, the sadness for their condition, and then finding through the art form, through the musical art form that they created as a result of that searching, that striving to release what was inside, finding a kind of spiritual transcendence or a, a means to endure or to transcend their circumstances and their conditions, or to give them the strength to get from one moment to one moment, from one hour to one to the next hour, from one day to the next day. And that is generated again through this kind of um, experience of deep suffering. I relate that very much to the experience of the life of Abdul Baha, and who is someone who also knew a lot about the nature of suffering. And Abdul Baha has this kind of really beautiful relationship um, or beautiful regard for people of African descent. And I would argue that the, one of the main reasons is because he recognized, he understood, he could enter deeply into a kind of um, uh, spiritual uh, commune with people of African descent because he understood the nature of suffering. So a few examples of that, Abdul, uh, Abdul Baha Abbas is born into a privileged family in Tehran, Iran on May 23rd, 1844. At an early age, he suffered dispossession, poverty, and exile. He was a political prisoner in the prison city of Akka in Israel until 1908 at the age of 64. He felt the terrible pain of family separation from when his beloved father was imprisoned for four months in the most notorious dungeon in all of Iran. This is particularly significant to me because I have family members who are incarcerated so that I feel that, that kind of um, fraternal fellowship um, with that experience. He suffered the deep emotional pain of seeing his father, Baha'u'llah, in heavy chains while he was in prison. Very powerful story. He was brought to visit his father uh, into what was known as the Black Pit, a deep dungeon, a subterranean dungeon. And Baha'u'llah was brought out, uh, was uh, being brought out to meet him. Abdul Baha was, was being carried into the Black Pit, but they heard the voice of Baha'u'llah in the darkness saying, do not bring him in here. And so he was met, he was taken back out and Baha'u'llah came up to meet him in the courtyard. And when Abdul Baha saw his father in his condition, he was so overwhelmed with grief that he fainted. And I think quite oftentimes of my nephew, um, cousins who were incarcerated and when their family goes in to see him, the pain that they must feel um, as they're, they still have this love for their family member and they see the suffering that they're going through and they also know that they can't reach them. He suffered a debilitating bout of tuberculosis. He was ridiculed and ostracized for his religious beliefs. He suffered frostbite at the age of nine. He endured a two year separation from his father during the period of Baha'u'llah's self-imposed exile. His younger brother Mirza Mitti died in 1868, falling through a skylight in Akka while reciting prayers. He was betrayed by members of his own family because of jealousy. So all of these things, either all of them or some of them perhaps are familiar to some of you. And that kind of familiarity and commonality, that relationship uh, with parts of my own journey with that of uh, Abdul Baha. And again, this is where the blues music comes out of this deep well of suffering. And Abdul Baha's interface, his ability to speak to human beings, to offer them what they needed in the moment, I would argue part of that comes out of his understanding of suffering, not as a theoretical supposition, but as a deeply embodied experiential um, process that he was engaged with through many different parts of his life. So he understood it in a very deep way. So Abdul Baha makes this, says this thing about people of African descent. And we talked a moment ago about his kind of close association with the black community. He says, oh thou who art pure in heart, sanctified in spirit, peerless in character, beauteous in face, thy photograph have been received, revealing thy physical frame and the utmost grace and the best appearance. Thou art dark in countenance and bright in character. Thou art like unto the pupil of the eye, which is dark in color, yet it is the fount of light and the revealer of the contingent world. This quote was, um, uh, this quote from Abdul Baha was in response to a photograph he received of Robert Turner, the first African-American Baha'i, who was a formerly enslaved person who after he gained his freedom would spend the rest of his life as a domestic servant. He also accompanied the first group of Western pilgrims um, to Akka, to the prison city of Akka, to visit with Abdul Baha. And uh, this was 
how Abdul Baha saw him and indeed how he saw people of African descent. So there's some kind of, there's a relationship here that is really profound. He is looking into the qualities and character of people of, of African descent, and he is seeing a spiritual quality of perception and sight. Now, Abdul Baha, the, the Baha'i writings, Abdul Baha says that, um, and the guardian, Shoghi Effendi, the um, grandson of Abdul Baha, would have ultimately become the head of the faith after the passing of Abdul Baha, um, that he expounds on this further. But this quality of sight and perception is as a result of the suffering of the black community. Again, in the face of slavery, of Jim Crow, of institutionalized racism. And I would argue based on the history that this power of insight and perception, a spiritual quality was developed out of necessity in order to survive. So what was critical for people of African descent uh, during the time of slavery was that we understood not only ourselves, but we under also understood the owner, the slave master, and how they thought and their patterns of behavior, those who had dominion over our bodies, so that we could calculate, we could calibrate our behavior, our emotions, how we move through the world to avoid displacement, to avoid uh, abuse, indeed sometimes even avoid death. The prerequisite, the power of perception, the ability to see deep into the human condition, to see both the outer and the inner reality. And that cultivated quality, that ability to see both the contingent, what is, what is seen and also what is hidden. When I went to West Africa, it was really powerful. Um, I met uh, my guide, who was a brother from Ghana named Gideon, really beautiful brother. And when he walked up to me, he said, I see you. And I said, wow, you know, because here in the States, I'll, I'll say when I see, you know, one of my partners in the street, yo, what's up, man? How you doing? What's going on, dog? And he said, I see you. And then he explained, he said, when I say I see you, it's not just that I see your physical being. I see your spiritual being. So he, in the greeting in West Africa, they are exemplifying and embodying this notion of this duality of sight, this ability to see both the contingent world and also the spiritual world what is seen visibly and also what is hidden beyond the visibility of the physicality of the person, what is within. So I thought that was quite beautiful. Uh, just a diagram of the eye. Um, we see the pupil at the heart of the eye. The, the uh, faculty of sight is held within the pupil. Quite interesting about this diagram, we also see the sclera, which surrounds the eye, this whiteness. And in the Baha'i faith, there is this belief that everything in the physical world is an allegory or metaphor for everything in the spiritual world. So we see this interrelationship between the white and the black people, how the white reinforces the black to protect its sight and its vision, and how the black depends also on the protection of the white. There's this interrelationship. The one needs the other. They are not mutually exclusive. In order for the eye to function, they both have to be healthy. They both have to work in unison to reinforce and to protect the other. The blues often exist at the intersection of the sacred and the profane, the mundane and the majestic, the ordinary and the extraordinary pathos, struggle, complex moral dilemmas, release and redemption are common elements. And then this, and this quote from the great James Baldwin, in all jazz and especially the blues, there is something tart and ironic, authoritative and double-edged. To be sensual, I think, is to respect and rejoice in the force of life, of life itself, and to be present in all that one does from the effort of loving to the breaking of bread. So again, that the first quote, this intersection of these two realities, the sacred and the profane, right? The mundane and the majestic, the ordinary and the extraordinary, the blues coming out of that kind of the tension between those two realities. And then Baldwin counseling us that to be fully present in all of life is to, in some sense, be an echo, be a reflection, be an embodiment of the blues. This is a uh, piece I wanted to share, um, which embodies, in a sense, um, kind of like uh, the artistic tradition of the blues in theatrical form. Uh, this is from the play Fences, um, starring uh, the, the first production on Broadway, which starred James Earl Jones and a very young Courtney B. Vance, as you can see there on the right, who I think at that time was a student at Yale University. Um, powerful piece. This is, this is from August Wilson's cycle of plays, where he chronicled the African-American journey from the time of slavery 
all the way to um, the contemporary moment in a cycle of 10 plays. And Fences is one of those famous, so I'm gonna play this right now. This is a difficult piece to watch because it's gonna deal, it deals with some complex and jarring realities within the context of the black community. But nevertheless, there is love embodied within it. If we can look beyond the surface, uh, we can see the love within it, this intersection of this kind of what, seem, what is seemingly cruel and but also love embedded within the cruelty as well. So the intersection of those two realities. A memorable scene by James Earl Jones as a stern father who has struggled to build a life and keep control of his family shows him teaching his son a painful lesson about setting his expectations for affection. Can I ask you a question? What the hell you wanna ask me? This is the wiki is the one you got the questions for. How come you ain't never liked me? Liked you? Who in the hell ever said, I got to like you? What law is there to say, I got to like you? Do you want to stand up in my face and ask me some damn fool ass question like that? Talk about liking somebody. <laughs> come here, boy, when I talk to you. Straighten up, goddammit. Ask your question. What law is there to say I got to like you? None. All right, then. Don't you eat every day? Answer me when I talk to you. Don't you eat every day? Yeah. Nigga, as long as you live in my house, you put a sir on the end of it when you talk to me. Yes, sir. You eat every day? Yes, sir. Got a roof over your head? Yes, sir. And clothes on your back? Yes, sir. Why do you think that is? Because of you. Hell, I know it's because of me. Why do you think that is? Because you like me? Like you. I go out of here every morning and bust my butt putting up with them crackers all day long because I like you. You is the biggest fool I ever saw. It is my job. It is my responsibility. You understand that? A man got to take care of his family. You live in my house. You sleep your behind on my bedclothes. You put my food in your belly because you are my son. You are my flesh and blood, not because I like you. It is my duty to take care of you. I owe a responsibility to you. Wait now. Let's get this straight right now. But we'll go along any further. I ain't got to like you. Mr. Rand, don't give me my money come payday because he liked me. He give me because he owe me. Now, I didn't give you everything I had to give you. I gave you your life. Your mama and me worked it out between us. And lacking your black ass was not a part of the bargain. And don't you try and go through life worried if somebody like you or not. You best make sure that they are doing right by you. You understand what I'm saying, boy? Yes, sir. Then you get the hell out of my face and go on down under A&P. Powerful lesson from um, uh, James L. Jones. A memorable scene by James Earl Jones. As a Let me go back here. Uh, it's difficult to watch because obviously uh, his son is asking for affirmation uh, from his father. Uh, but what uh, James, James L. Jones' character is trying to give him uh, the kind of internal fortitude to deal with the racism he's going to encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. He's doing it in the only way he knows. He is a man limited by his circumstances and his condition. He's loving his son in the only way he knows, as flawed and as difficult as it is. And that in and of itself is kind of like this embodiment of the blues, doing the best you can, tapping into your spiritual resources, even sometimes when uh, the way that you've been socialized is flawed and difficult. You do the best you can out of that to create something regenerative and restorative. And that's what he uh, is trying to do uh, within that context. A couple examples from, uh, let me go back here, from um, one example anyway, from the world of visual art, uh, Romir Bearden, the great uh, African-American uh, painter and collage artist from the Harlem Renaissance uh, period up until the 1980s. This is called Empress of the Blues. Uh, Bessie Smith on the right, I'm not gonna play that, but it's her rendition of St. Louis blues. Bessie Smith can, considered to be uh, one of the pillars of the blues tradition. 
and she's uh, singing about the trials and difficulties of being a woman and indeed being a black woman in America. And through song and release, she's creating something redemptive through art that will sustain her and her community and allow us to move forward as we deal with the challenges and difficulties of moving through life. My yeah, man's got a heart <laughs> like a rocket in the sea. My man's got a heart okay, like Just a little bit of Betsy. So let's see if I can get this thing to move forward. If not, there we go. Check that out. Okay. Um, roots of the blues within the embodied musical and dance traditions of West Africa. Again, this impulse to express oneself, which I think all cultures do around the world historically, we've been doing that since the beginning of time, since the first, first cave paintings. Uh, in West Africa, they have this tradition of dance and one can see in the artistic traditions of people of African descent here in the United States, whether you're talking about the musical form, whether you're talking about dance, whether you're talking about acting, whether you're talking about writing, what have you, there is this ability to um, this quality of using the arts as a means to give voice to that which is hidden, to express ourselves fully, to give release of the human spirit. And going back to Africa when I was there last uh, November and December, I could see the root of that. And I wanted to share just a little bit of that with you. <laughs> Little bit of that and i'll share a little bit of the when i went to mende land which is one of the main tribal groups where i'm descended from in sierra leone the entire village came out and did a dance for us and this is one of the examples of one of those dances <laughs> Examples of that. I don't want you to do that. Let's see if you can go forward. Go forward. There we go. Okay. Talked about an idiom, characteristic mode of expression in music or art. Um, we talked a little bit about the difference between uh, an embodied coolness, coolness referring to the color blue. Uh, color blue, you know, has references in terms of water in terms of like a cool uh, disposition and ability to respond to challenging circumstances with a level head and ability to maintain one's coolness. Um, in the black community, we often use language um, with multiple, we use uh, phrases and words with double, sometimes triple, sometimes quadruple meanings. So a word like cool uh, has uh, multiple meanings. Um, two iterations of that would be something like, yo, it's, it's cool in here meaning that the temperature is cool, or yo, it is so cool in here, meaning that the vibe is chill, it's cool, it feels really nice in here. It doesn't have anything to do with temperature, it's more of a spiritual thing. So, you know, we, we talked about the difference between this kind of like embodied coolness, something that is deeply rooted, and a performative type of coolness. And on the right, we have an example from Barclay L. Hendricks, L. Hendricks excuse me, uh, Sir Charles alias Willie, Willie Harris from 1972. Barclay Hendricks is one of the preeminent uh, uh, artists, painters of the 20th century. 
he did this piece uh, back in the early 70s, the height of a kind of like coolness that came out of the uh, black community, the urban ghettos of the black community, uh, the, you know, some of the, uh, the inner city uh, places like uh, New York City and, uh, you know, Philadelphia, so forth and so on. And there was this kind of like this, this, this coolness, this sense of in the way that we dress and what we wear and how our hair is kept, the way we move through space, the right coat, the right shoe. Uh, black folks might be historically might be materially poor, but we will always find enough money to look good for church on Sunday. And there is something about that. It's about um, a celebration of ourselves in spite of the circumstances which many of us have been forced to grow up in and live within. We still are going to find some way to honor ourselves, even if to some folks it might seem to be um, something that is not important or not um, that should not be given that due attention. And this is not just, this is not an innovation of black folks here in the United States. I saw this in Africa. When I went to the village, people are very poor in the village. I mean, poor by the standards of the West. They're very rich in terms of community and it seems like everybody has what they need. But if you looked at it and compared to what you had to your comfortable home, to your two or three cars that you drive or whatever it is that you have, in that spectrum, they would be viewed as being materially poor. But I saw folks that were decked out in these communities and just dressed to the nines. Every pattern, every color, every um, combination you could possibly imagine. And they look like fashion models on a, a Paris runway somewhere, just beautiful. So uh, Barkley L. Hendricks here is referring to this kind of like performative coolness here where he's showing this brother on the street with his trench coat, his, uh, his loafer shoes, uh, you know, his uh, two-tone loafer shoes. I mean, looking very, uh, very swag, wingtip shoes, very swag. And then on the left, um, I wanted to play another example of hip hop, um, which is from the Diggable Planet. It's one of my all time favorite hip hop pieces from 1993. I'm just going to play a little bit of this. And they are specifically talking about the rebirth of slick, of cool, right? So they, the, the, the song on the surface refers to this kind of like performative iteration of coolness of slick. But I would also Im argue that within the context of their particular idiom, their mode of expression, they are also alluding to an embodied coolness, an embodied kind of slickness, something that comes from kind of like a deeper conviction beyond the material. Float straight out of our lids. Them, they got boo bodies, hard rock Brooklyn kids. Us floor rush when they DJ boom and classics. You dig the crew on the fattest hip hop record. He touched the kinks and sinks into the sounds. She frequents deep, fatter joints called undergrounds. Our funk zooms like you hit the Mary Jane. They flock to booms, man, boogie had to change. Who freaks the clips with mad amount percussion? Where kinky hair goes to unthought of dimensions. Why is it so fly? Cause hip hop kept some drama. When butterfly rock the light, loose sway boomers. What? By the cut, we push it off the corner. How was the buzz entire hip hop era? Was fresh and fact since they started saying Audi? Cuz funk's made fat from right beneath my hood. The pooba of the styles like miles and shit. Like 60s funky worms with waves and perms. Just sending junky rhythms right down your block. We beat to rap what key beat to lock. But I'm cool like that. 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 I'm cool. The chocolates tap to my raps. She innovates at the sweet of cat naps. He at the funk club with the vibrate. Them, they be crazy down with the five me. It can't kick a plan, then a crowd burst. Me, I be digging it with the bug burst. All right, just a little flavor of that. I don't want to hit y'all with too much of that. So we still got more to cover. Um, so let's look at uh, some really uh, visceral examples of this performative kind of coolness. On the left, uh, Miles Davis from his. Uh, cover around about midnight, Miles Davis embodies a kind of like cool, externalized swagger. I mean, he is from the 60s jazz scene. He is the picture in the dictionary of what cool was. 
and all of it is none of it is arbitrary. He is making some serious decisions about his appearance when it came to being photographed, the shades, the horn placed just so, the suit, the cut, everything, and the lighting. It is all about projecting a kind of image of coolness. Foxy Brown on the right, don't mess around with Foxy Brown. She's the meanest chick in town. Pam Greer from 1970s. I had a huge crush on Pam Greer. Not only was she beautiful, but she was also really cool, uh, really a bad lady in these films. Um, and again, this kind of performative uh, iteration of coolness. Uh, and of course, the famous photograph of Jay-Z, a young Jay-Z. Uh, he's got this kind of posture. He's got the gold chain. He's rocking. The face is kind of, the head is kind of cocked back in a certain you know, attitude. He's looking down over his eyelids, you know, just really projecting this kind of image of coolness. And then this quote underneath from my Morehouse classmate, Saul Williams, internationally renowned poet. He says, hip hop is still cool at a party, but to me, hip hop has never been strictly a party. It is also there to elevate consciousness. Now, if we take that, we look again at the beginning of the presentation where Baha'u'llah is talking about the purpose of art, to elevate our consciousness, to take us to new heights, like a ladder for the soul. Saul is reiterating that through this um, statement that he made. Powerful stuff. The blues is not passive. It is an active, idiosyncratic, spiritually expressive modality of survival, for survival. We talked about that. How this, uh, you know, this development in artistic forms, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Phil Holler songs, um, you know, the spirituals, uh, the blues, you know, all of that. It, it's uh, this spiritually expressive modality for survival. It is created out of an existential threat. And then Tupac Shakur with this quote from one of his songs, did you hear about the rose that grew from a crack in the concrete? Proven nature's laws wrong. It learned how to walk without having feet. Funny it seemed, but it, by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete. When no one else even cared, no one else even cared the rose that grew from concrete. I love this quote from Tupac because I think it embodies sometimes the way that we look at certain people in our marginalized communities, the way that we undervalue their capacity and their potential and how we have to realize that even in those communities, quite oftentimes, the thing that we're walking past and we're dismissing actually, in some sense, plays a key part in our own salvation. And so we have to recognize that in these marginalized spaces, in these um, spaces that are economically deprived, in these spaces that you know, may not look like the spaces that we come from, that there are roses struggling to sprout out of those difficult circumstances. And I, for one, want to cultivate and encourage the sprouting of those flowers and those roses. Examples of embodied coolness and principled swag, a swag and a coolness that is deeply embodied. It comes, it is built from the inside out, not from the outside in. Many of these people I'm sure you can recognize, Harriet Tubman, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King, Mary McLeod Bethune, um, Elaine Locke, Nelson Mandela, uh, Robert Smalls, the list goes on and on. These are extraordinary individuals who embodied coolness. It came from the inside out. It was grounded in a kind of uh, spirituality, in a morality, in a principled approach to life. And not only that, but many of them were willing to die for their convictions. So this, uh, from my vantage point, is the real seed of real coolness really comes from, where that quality of being able to maintain one's composure, one's peace of mind in the midst of trouble and difficulty, it springs from the inside out. You can't put it on. You can pretend, but it's not, if you're pretending, it's not grounded in anything authentic. The Baha'i Faith says that truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. That means if I'm cool, that coolness is rooted in something real. It's authentic, it's grounded. And we talked about this, uh, differences between affected and embodied coolness, performative in nature, not grounded, is not performance-based, more often than not, withstand, it withstands the onslaught of test. Um, obsessively preoccupied with presentation built from the outside in. The opposite, outward presentation is a reflection of inter internal integrity built from the inside out so forth and so on. Abdu'l-Baha, archetype of the cool. Um, this was in the song that we just heard. My name is Abdu'l-Baha. Uh, my identity is Abdu'l-Baha. My qualification is Abdu'l-Baha. My reality is Abdu'l-Baha. My praise is Abdu'l-Baha. Thraldom to the blessed perfection is my glorious and refulgent diadem, and servitude to all the human race is my perpetual religion. 
No name, no title, no mention, no commendation have he, nor will he ever have except Abdul Baha. This is my longing. This is my supreme apex. This is my greatest yearning. This is my eternal life. This is my everlasting glory. Not the acquisition of riches, friends, not the social, the, the, the acquiring of a certain social position, not the hoarding of power and of resources, right? Not the attainment of an advanced degree. Servitude to all the human race is my perpetual religion. That is a profound inversion of the current social order, which prioritizes me first at the expense of others, which seeks fame and glory and acclaim and money. Abdu'l-Baha embodies a profound deviation from that perversion and a realignment with spiritual principles, spiritual qualities, and spiritual virtues. This is a picture of me at the door of no return in Elmina Castle in Ghana, one of the most moving experiences in my life. The architecture of that castle is such that when you uh, the, the hallway bef uh, b beyond me, that's behind me in the darkness, uh, it gets thinner as you get towards the door because they were trying to um, control the crowd as people move towards the ship. And the door is big enough only to admit one body at a time because they were worried about revolt. But to stand at that precipice and look out at the Atlantic Ocean and to think about the journey, the hell that these people were about to enter, my ancestors, the ancestors of many African-Americans, people of the diaspora, and to realize that from that hell, all of this incredible artistry was created in spite, in spite of going through that abyss. Um, and that the only thing that these individuals had to, had to take with them were memories, in most instances, and faith. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And that's what they had within them as they moved across that oceanic graveyard called the Atlantic Ocean and moved into the theater of this great wilderness we call America to experience what they'd experienced. It's a profound lesson for all of humanity, for all of us. It's not just my story, it's collective, it's humanity's collective story. Talked about uh, the cool the spiritual meaning of blue is cool, calm, and grounded. It symbolizes cold air and water and lays on the opposite end of the spectrum from red, which represents heat and energy. The feelings that associate peaceful scenes like this are typically calming, soothing, and serene. Cool has been used to describe a general state of calmness, well-being, a transcendent internal state of peace and serenity. It can also refer to an absence of conflict, a state of harmony and balance, as in the land is cool, or as in a cool spiritual heart. Such meanings according to Thompson, that's Robert Ferris Thompson, uh, now deceased professor of African studies at Yale University are African in origin. Cool is related in this sense to both social control and transcendental balance. Cool can similarly be used to describe composure and an absence of excitement in a person, especially in times of stress, as expressed in the idiom, to keep your cool. The word can also be used to express agreement or consent, as in the phrase, I'm cool with that. One of the spiritual uh, uh, principles um, um, of um, consistent in all the great religions is, um, you know, this this uh, principle of magnanimity, this principle of um, of detachment, this this principle of um, peace, maintaining our coolness in the face of adverse conditions. It doesn't mean that sometimes we don't cry out in pain or in anguish. We all do that, but eventually the goal is always to bring ourselves back to a place where we can think clearly where we can, having exercised ourselves of those, um, of, of, of those uh, instinctive emotions, we bring ourselves back to a place of tranquility and we're able to move through whatever challenging circumstances that present themselves. When I was in Mende land in Sierra Leone, I, went, I, went, uh, I was in the village and I noticed a very beautiful but simple um, practice that I just thought almost moved me to tears. And that was this young boy here who couldn't be more than nine or 10. 
and he was guiding this elderly man who was on staff. This man is blind. And it was this young man's uh, duty given to him by the chief to guide this man around the community so that he would feel himself a part of the village, a part of the tribe, a part of the community. He would never feel apart or separate from it. And so I just took that photograph. I thought it was quite beautiful. We talked about the, um, the inversion of the social order, how, um, how Abdul Baha and his character and his being reflects the realignment of the priorities of humanity, um, moving away from ego and selfishness to a service kind of oriented life, a selflessness, yes, right? And how servitude is the highest state that humanity can strive to attain. It's a work of art I did um, about the David T. Howard School, which was mentioned in my bio. Um, this is a piece created from an old growth elm tree. The David T. Howard School during the time of reconstruction after slavery was one of only two schools that would educate black children in the city of Atlanta. They asked me to take one of the trees that was planted on the original grounds of the school and turn it into a work of art. So what I did was I worked with the Alumni Association, people in their 80s, 90s, their 70s, I made castings of their hands and turned them into tree branches that grow off the body of the tree. And the hands reach towards uh, the, the David T. Howard School, which is across the street um, from this park site. All right, we, can, we don't need to show that. That was just a video of the tree. We don't need to see that. No. Lord have mercy. Let's see. Here we go. OK. Um, let's move past this. So I want us to get to some conversation. OK, so we've been talking a lot about music. We've been talking a lot about um, artistic expression um, and how um, the blues, a lot of it within the African-American community is generated out of the blues, out of that experience of deep pain um, and sorrow, and then also turning that pain and that sorrow into joy miraculously in a kind of alchemical, spiritually based way. Um, I, I don't know, to be honest with you, uh, I've studied uh, Abdul Baha's life. I don't know if he carried a secret uh, talent for playing an instrument. I don't know if he could sing. I don't know if he could play the drums, play the flute. I don't know if he could act. I don't know if he could paint. What I do know is that he was an artist and his principal material, his principal medium was the human heart. And that was the sacred instrument that he played, that he plucked on in order to transform um, human beings as he came in contact with people at various different parts of his life. Um, he had this ability to give give a person exactly what they needed. And, and embodied, that story for me is embodied, um, that quality is embodied in this story that I remember that really moved me when I was first investigating the faith. And Abdu'l-Bahá was visiting the United States at the time. And he was visiting a home and he was on the steps, this was in the city, I believe it was in New York. He was on the steps leading up to the home and there were a group of boys and uh, they were, um, I think from the, from the mission or they were a group of boys from the neighborhood who were obviously in a poor condition. They didn't have much material resources. The group was, uh, it was mostly white boys. It was almost 99% white boys. There was one black child in the group who stood off to the side uh, because of the, this is the early 1900s, and because of the imposition of the perverse social order at the time, which mandated that uh, he was less of value than these uh, the white children. And Abdu'l-Bahá had this custom of passing out candies or sweets to children, or uh, maybe giving a little bit of money if he had it in his pocket, um, or whatever he had on him to help alleviate the suffering of the poor. And he uh, asked the, the, the young black child to come forward. Now, remember, this is the early 1900s, friends. We're talking around uh, 1910, 1911, somewhere in there. He asked the black child to come forward. He held up a chocolate to his skin, and he says, what you have here is a chocolate sweet. Look how beautiful. And I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that's what he said. And he was making a statement in the early 1900s, years before the civil rights movement, years before the majestic, beautiful, brilliant, um, you know, a woman who uh, stayed in a bus seat, uh, Miss Rosa Parks, and refused to give up her seat, years before that, uh, that powerful incident, he is making a statement through his actions 
through his words that in this faith, unlike the practices that are imposed upon the social order at this time, in this faith, everybody has a seat at the table. Everybody is valuable, regardless of your color, regardless of your social condition, regardless of what position you have in society, regardless of how educated, how uneducated you are, whether you have a PhD or no D, it does not matter. In this faith, you are valuable and you have a seat at the table. Uh, um, and this is the story, uh, uh, I'm referring here to a story of the Black Rose um, and this quote from Abdul Baha, um, associate with each other, think of each other and be like a rose garden. Anyone who goes into a rose garden will see various roses, white, pink, yellow, red, all growing together and replete with adornment. Each one accentuates the beauty of the other. Were all one color, the garden would be monotonous to the eye. If they were all white or yellow or red, the garden would lack variety and attractiveness. But when the colors are varied, white, pink, yellow, red, there will be the greatest beauty. Therefore, I hope that you will be like a rose garden. Although different in colors, yet, praise be to God, you receive rays from the sun. And that's from the promulgation of universal peace. Abdu'l-Baha um, compared um, an African-American uh, to a black rose at one point as well, and um, talked about uh, the sweetness of the rose, the sweetness of that spirit. And again, seizing the opportunity to teach us um, about the oneness of humanity. Our goal is to take our place in the garden, friends. Our goal is to seek to cultivate our sweetness, is to seek to cultivate the sweetness in one another, is to seek to understand that diversity is predicated on the dynamic, unity is predicated on the, di the dynamic force of diversity, and that an appreciation, a love, the diversity of the human family is at the heart of how we were created. And so, and to see others not as different and apart from ourselves, but as part of that family, and not as a theoretical supposition, not as an abstraction, but as a real living, breathing reality that we cultivate on a day-to-day -day basis in our own lives, and that we seek opportunities to include those who have been pushed to the margins and to take full responsibility of our own awakening to that oneness, to that reality of unity. And as we look around and we see all of the disunity in the world, we see all of the warfare, all of the crumbling of these institutions that we previously put so much faith into, and people are feeling distressed, they're feeling distraught, they're feeling on edge. There is also a countervailing process going on at the same time. And that is a constructive process where people are building relationships building up institutions, serving their community across cultural lines, building relationships that will create a new world, a new destiny for humanity, that finally allows us to get up off our knees of adolescence and stand firmly, squarely on our feet and move into our adulthood. And that's all I got, friends. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Hopefully we have some time, let's see, with some questions and Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone has questions, you can put it in the chat. We already have some. Uh, the first one is, when we understand the nature and wisdom of suffering, how does the feeling of suffering change? Yeah, no small questions today. Um, well, if you, if, it's, if you can find, my, my feeling about this is if you can find a reason in it, if you can find a hidden meaning in it, I mean, if it's true that that black people are the people of the eye, I believe that we do have that capacity um, to see both the um, objective and the subjective reality. And I believe it's cultivated out of existential threat. Um, then in some sense, that's the gift that we have on the other side of that suffering. Um, and I think about my own self, my own personal journey. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I say it without any, um, looking not to emphasize it, but I'm, a, I'm an abuse survivor. And I think about, I think about um, my interaction with children and with young people. 
And one of the great things, one of the great blessings for me is that I can recognize when a child is having challenges and difficulties very quickly. And I do not know if I would have that capacity, that ability, had I not gone through what I went through. So that is the gift that comes on the other side of that. And as such, as part of that gift is that I think in many ways, when I'm interfacing, I'm, I'm interacting with young people, I have the privilege of being, of teaching um, um, young black men at Morehouse College. And there is, there is a familiarity there that I have with them. There's not much that they have experienced in their lives that I don't have some kind of relationship to. And I don't know if I would have that gift, that capacity to, to to, to develop and establish and maintain that kind of intimacy had I not been through some of those experiences myself. So that is, that's finding purpose through the pain. But that's my way of finding purpose in the pain. And I think understanding that, that there can be purpose even in the midst of great suffering and then asking God to give us the wisdom to see the purpose, I think is, the, uh, is part of the journey. How might the harsh living conditions, scant rainfall, less rivers for transport, tribal violence, et cetera, influence the proverbial coolness? Despite the hazardous living conditions, Africans don't appear faced by it, but possess instead a joy de vivre a, and project an air of being unaffected by the life's direst vicissitudes and animals' brutality. Yeah, I think we have to be careful, friends. Um, we have to be careful that, you know, there's an emphasis quite oftentimes on, um, on finding joy in the midst of this pain. And that it, it's important to do that. But we also have to remember um, that it's also important to be honest about what we're feeling. And that anger or sadness, right, are also valid emotions, particularly when they're associated with injustice, right? When I was in West Africa, um, the people that I encountered, um, people of the Akan people, the Mende people, they do have this kind of inner joy, but they also have a very sobering analysis about the repercussions and ramifications of colonialism, and they don't hesitate to talk about it. So there's this, there's this holding of these two realities, right? There's this reality of this is, this is what has happened as a result of colonialism, racism, right? And also, we're going to find ways to still maintain our joy, our ability to move forward as community and society, while at the same time respecting, right, the repercussions or ramifications of this history of colonialism. So I say that to say that I say that because I want to make sure that we're able to hold those two realities at the same time. Um, I don't feel I don't particularly feel good about the experience of black people in America, generally speaking in terms of our material station collectively as a people, how we've been locked out of that system historically. I don't feel good about institutionalized racism. I don't feel good about um, the history of rape and of murder associated with black people in America. So I hold that reality there, right? I hold that. And my way of finding purpose, you know, associated with the, out of the anger, the pain, the sadness associated with that is to take that and to look for, to, to help to create and to look for modalities of constructive resilience. How can I use that pain and create purpose out of that pain? So anyway. Um, are rhythm and reiterative songs and melodies a means to transcend it all? Not to, well, I don't know if it's a means to transcend it all. I think these are, this is one modality of a number of constructive modalities. I think we have to be engaged in community service. I think we have to actively go, um, be willing to step outside of ourselves and our communities to um, make acquaintances and then turn those acquaintances into meaningful friendships. Um, all of these things together, working to be of service to community, um, expressing ourselves through art, whatever that art form is, um, serving each other. All of these um, are ways of transcending. Um, prayer, meditation, exercise, all of these things are uh, form a toolkit for allowing us to uh, find a way out of no way, as Mahalia Jackson would say. So. We have a comment that Lord Krishna is often depicted as blue, the symbol of universal awareness. Yes, absolutely. 
there's a whole it's interesting because if you look in the in the history of jazz there's a whole period in the in the like the late i would say the early 60s to like the mid 60s maybe late 50s uh where a lot of the records are tinted in blue so there was a whole period um where all of these records miles davis other great artists um where their records are tinted in blue and um so there's this whatever was going on at the time there was this kind of something moving through the zeitgeist the zeitgeist at that moment that um you know really impacted that art form think about coolness and and um tranquility and that sort of thing you guys are easy man it's a piece of cake <laughs> they dropped some big ones on you but i think <laughs> yeah yeah no we we, we had some media ones yeah um Okay, well, thank you so much. This was a really uh, interesting and very unique presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. So these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time, and I put the link to our mailing list and YouTube channel in the chat. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye.